Welcome everyone to this Zoom Into Books presentation with our very special guest, David Selby, and guest interviewer, Burke Allen from Allen Media Strategies. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Go ahead and take it away, Burke. Hey, thank you so much, Ashley. And uh, through the magic of the internet, we're broadcasting not only on Facebook all over the world, on Zoom, also on our Big Time Talker podcast, which is powered by Speaker Match. I'm in Washington, D.C., the headline books, folks, are in the Carolinas and West Virginia. And my fellow native West Virginian, David Selby, joins us from the Gold Coast of California. Hello, sir. Hello, hello. Thank <laughs> How you so are much. you, sir? Well, doing great. And thank you so much for taking time to visit with us today. And, and I say that with the full realization that lots of folks in the movie and television business have a lot of extra time on their hands. You are no longer able to be on set right now. They have a lot of extra time. So, you know, it, it's all of a sudden you say, oh, yeah, I finally have time to do that, you know. And then I say, oh, well, what should I read today? And then I, I look behind me here or I go into the library and I say, oh, my God, you know, there's a, there's a hundred books I haven't read. So, And we should point out that you're also uh, an award-winning author. Your latest book, Promises of Love, also a casualty of indifference, available from headlinebooks.com. I, I want to rewind way back, though. You originally are a West Virginia boy. You're from the Morgantown area around West Virginia University. Tell me about growing up in the Mountain State and, and how that has sort of informed your life. Oh, my goodness. Everything I, uh, I owe so much to where I grew up, uh, all over West Virginia. And uh, I grew up in Morgantown. Um, our farm, my grandparents' farm was about, oh, I don't know, six miles away, eight miles away. Um, and uh, I just, uh, you know, I went to elementary school, junior high, high school, and then uh, I went to college, right, at West Virginia University. And it was there uh, I met, uh, one day during registration, simply because <laughs> he was in charge of uh, the S's, the names who began with S, you know, and so it turned out that his, his name was Charles Neal, and I called him Chuck, and uh, uh, Dr. Neal, Mr. Neal, Professor Neal, um, taught in the theater department at West Virginia University. So my second year there, I ran into him at registration and he said, well, and I was confused or unsure about what I was going to take. Uh, and he said, well, why don't you try a theater course? And I said, all right. And that was it. And he stuck with me all the way. And uh, one day I asked him, what do you have to do to be an actor? And he said, go to New York. And I said, oh. And he said, yeah, and go to New York for 10 years. So anyway, I went for about 10 days, <laughs> got lost and headed back to West Virginia. And uh, I ended up doing, um, there was a play in, outside of Beckley, West Virginia, Grandview State Park called Hunting in the Rock. And a uh, lovely man wrote it, Kermit Hunter, who had done other outdoor dramas written, written them. And so I went down. I they found me a role to do in that play, Hunting in the Rock, down in Beckley. And uh, the second year I went back, I believe it was the second, I think I went, did it, yes, two years. I met my wife, who was from Beckley, West Virginia. And um, Beckley, West Virginia was uh, the home of, um, you know, uh, your dear uh, friend, uh, Kathy Teets. Our publisher, and, that's right. <laughs> and subsequently, her daughter, um, Ashley. And so they knew my wife early on, uh, Kathy did, and Kathy's sister, Patty, long, long before I did. Anyway, we got married and headed back uh, up to Morgantown, where I, we both went on to graduate school there. And then eventually uh, we headed out. Um, we went back to New York eventually after a few other sojourns, but we ended up back in New York. And uh, that's, you know, 
and still together after all these years, which is very unusual in the entertainment <laughs> business. Yeah. Yeah, she still puts up with me. <laughs> is that the secret? She still puts up with you? Yeah. Well, it's who I call, you know. Like getting on with you today, Burke. I said, help. <laughs> <laughs> so she came in and, you know, brought me her computer. For some reason, I couldn't get mine to work. But anyway, yeah, we're, we're um, we've been very, I've been very blessed, uh, you know, to have her with me. In fact, the first time we went to New York, uh, we were there and I had an offer of a teaching job and she said no she said no told me you're not doing it and I said well and she said that's not why you're here you came here to be an actor and so she took a job uh, at the American Bankers Association uh, in case you know the acting career didn't work out but eventually it it worked out and I've never had another job in my life except acting. That's so, fantastic. Uh, I've been blessed that way. So anyway, because of her, we stayed in we stayed in New York, and you know, the rest began is our journey. <laughs> David Selby is our guest today on this special co-broadcast of Zoom into Books and the Big Time Talker podcast. Actor and award-winning author and. Uh, Theater West Virginia, where you started, is still a going concern. Unfortunately, they're unable to do shows this summer because of COVID-19 and, and the coronavirus, but uh, yes, very involved with Theater West Virginia still. Hey, I I'm looking at a picture right now of you playing a werewolf. Uh, and, and this is from Dark Shadows, of course, where you played Quentin Collins. Was that, in your mind, was that the first big professional break? Yeah. Uh... Yeah, I had done a few plays, uh, a couple of plays before that. Um, I uh, For a while, I had ended up in um, Illinois, where we went on to uh, graduate school, and I uh, got acquainted uh, with, I was tall, so they said, well, you have to play Lincoln. Uh, and so I did a couple of plays out there. But yes, Dark Shadows was the first, uh, what, uh, big kind of television show and the character um the whole show did but that character happened to be uh i don't know what the word is burke but it it became very popular successful and uh, that character and that show has continued to um, follow me all the way <laughs> and uh, i've been i've been thankful very thankful for that and the people who, who originally watched that show, of course, they grew up to be parents and grandparents or whatever, and their children and watch it. Uh, it's still out there, you know. So when you do a television show during that time, this would be you know late '60s, early yeah. '70s. There are right. three, only three networks, and so uh, you know, unlike today, where there are all these digital channels and and so many different places for people to consume entertainment. When Dark Shadows took off, I was reading, you know, it started off really floundering. It was sort of like every other soap opera. But then when they introduced the supernatural element, and, vampires, and the, your werewolf character, the then werewolf it character, just, The vampire, just, Jonathan, right. Yeah, it just took off. And, and it was on the late afternoon, I guess, when kids came home from school. Yes. So how much, David, did, did your life change sort of immediately? Because everybody in America suddenly knows who you are and knows your face. Well, that must have been amazing. Well, it was, uh, yes, <laughs> it was. And uh, I never had a, you know, a bad moment uh, from it. In fact, so many things happened, you know. When I'd leave the studio at night, I'd have a, a bevy of... of <laughs> of the of kids of young children i thought they were young but they were young adults you know in junior high or whatever and they would follow me and every day outside the studio when the show would end that for that particular day we shot five episodes a week so every day every night we'd walk out of the studio at six o'clock or whatever and then there would just be you know so then i because it was with abc i had to do some appearances you know around and those are always just mass of, uh, of, of people. And I, there was so much fan mail 
and there was a, a lady there. Um, she had a magazine called 16 Magazine, and she had been a big supporter of The Doors, a rock group, sure. several people, Jim Morrison, all these. And she took me under her wing. And uh, she even bought me a shirt and said, this is the kind of shirt that uh, I think you should wear. And so she would shoot photographs of me all the time. And so she was responsible in that way. But the story writers, the, the writers of, uh, of Dark Shadows and Dan Curtis, the creator, um, they had, you know, they just, they were terrific. And the people that were in the show, Jonathan Frid, Joan Bennett, Joan Bennett had come back from Los Angeles where she had had a storied tele, uh, film career. And uh, she's the reason that Dark Shadows um, started out. They were willing to put it on. Um, and then it had been on for a little bit before uh, they came up with a new character. Quentin. We're talking, talking with David Selby today, a uh, famous actor, uh, award-winning author. His book, Promises of Love, as well as A Casualty of Indifference, available from Headline Books, and it's a special simulcast today of Zoom Into Books and the Big Time Talker podcast. You, you had something that happened to you that not very many actors have had, uh, David, and, and that is that you had a starring role on not one, but two iconic television shows. So After Dark Shadows, which, you know, as this, this seminal following is a, a horror soap, you made it into a, a primetime soap, and you were there for a long time. Talk to me about your, your time at Falcon Crest. Well, Falcon Crest, again, was a show that, um, you know, I had been fortunate, the, the production company uh, that, uh, you know, uh, Falcon Crest was under their wing. They had also started to show, um, you know, they were responsible for Dallas and everything. And these were all at the same time. And I was still in New York doing basically theater, the film here and there. And then, but pretty much soon after Dark Shadows, um, they en enticed me to move to Hollywood. Um, and it was there, much like my relationship with Joan Bennett on Dark Shadows, uh, it was there that I met Jane Wyman. And uh, Jane and I became uh, great pals, uh, good friends, and I'm still uh, friends uh, with Susan Sullivan, uh, who was uh, on the show, uh, Lorenzo Lamas, all of them, uh, so many of them, uh, uh, you know, uh, Margaret Ladd. I mean, I'm just, you know, thinking about all of these uh, people, Billy, uh, Billy Moses, who Billy, I still talk to. Uh, we're working on a little project together. So um, anyway, it again was a show that uh, where I got to meet so many different actors from around the world because they were brought on to the show. And that could have been Leslie Carone, Gina Lola Brigida, Kim Novak. Uh, Jane Greer, so many different, uh, you know, actors. Um, that Lorenzo, I mean, uh, yeah, I mentioned for, uh, Lorenzo, but uh, there were just so many um, that I got to work with, which was quite special. David Selby, our guest today, and we're talking about movies and television and books. And if you'd like to pick up a copy of one of David's books, including Promises of Love or A Casualty of Indifference, you can get them at davidselby.com. Uh, David has a, a great website that has all sorts of information about his long career in Hollywood and New York and uh, in front of the camera, as well as his, his many uh, books that he's written. Um, so you, you have these two very iconic television shows uh, and I want to talk about some of the movie roles that you have, but also, David, we're getting questions in and hellos from folks all over the country, all over the world, who are watching on Facebook Live and, and in our Zoom room today. 
director and filmmaker Danny Boyd says to tell you hello. Uh, uh, what a dear. Danny and I have worked together a number of times. So I just, hello, Danny. <laughs> we got, Danny, let's do something else. Um, anyway, yeah, that was, that was special because we hadn't touched base with each other in a long time. You hear that, Danny Boyd? Uh, Selby's hustling you for work. I heard that. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Here's a comment, David, uh, from someone who says, I enjoyed David's autobiography very much. Received it as a gift from my husband, signed by David. When we got engaged, I uh, love Dark Shadows. Here's a question from Sarah. Sarah says, uh, David, you've worked with and met so many famous people during your career. Do you, David Selby, ever get starstruck? That's a great question. Is there anybody that you got nervous about when you met them the first time? When I met them the first time? Yeah. Anybody that you were starstruck by? <laughs> um, yes. Yes. Um, I guess it would have to be, there were a couple of people, but Paul Newman. Wow. Uh, his Paul was married to Joanne Woodward. And Joanne and, uh, Joanne and I, uh, I met Joanne uh, because her mother had been a fan of dark, of doing Dark Shadows when I was doing Dark Shadows. Okay. And so I got a call one day at the studio, and um, it was uh, Joanna and saying that, David, I'm sorry. This is not for me, it's for my mother. Do you think she'd be able to come to the studio one day? <laughs> so we did arrange that. And then Joanna and I ended up with uh, doing a play together, a couple of play, a couple of things. And she uh, put me in touch with a man named Cyril Richard. And Cyril was doing a directing a play at the Shakespeare Festival up in Stratford, Connecticut. And we did that. And then Joanne and I and a lovely actress named Shirley Knight did a play called Children's Hour together. But it was during that time, and uh, my wife and I had a young son, just born. And then, but when we were up there, uh, Paul, uh, I met Paul. And he, a um, couple of times, he welcomed me backstage. I would, we would finish the performance and I'd come up and he handed me a beer, <laughs> a nice cold beer. Fantastic. That was, you know, and then I met through him, I met his daughter and I subleased her apartment in Los Angeles uh, when I came back. So I, um, I can't tell you what a lovely man he was. And Joanne, Joanne is still going strong. But uh, Paul, yes, I was a little, you know. A little starstruck, I A understand. little starstruck. And I was just watching a thing last night. Uh, Jacob Dylan, Bob Dylan's son. Yes. Um, has a documentary out. And it's about uh, the songwriters and yeah. the group that got together during the 60s. That's right. The uh, echoes from the canyon. I've seen that documentary. Sure. Have you seen it? Yes. Yes, sir. Well, it was during that time that just right after that 65, 66, 67, I came out to do a movie uh, to Los Angeles in around 71, 72 with uh, Barbara Streisand. And Barbara would have these, you know, I go over to her house and she had little gatherings when I say little gatherings, but I remember one gathering meeting Graham Nash. <laughs> wow. So it was all of those. And I must admit, I was a huge, huge fan of all of those groups back in those days. In fact, if I go through my old uh, record collection, which I'm going to do because I just watched that documentary last night, and uh, they lived up in Laurel Canyon, all that whole group. That's right. That's right. Anyway, exactly right. I, it was people like that that you got to meet that you were a little bit starstruck of. Oh, Besides meeting President Obama. 
Oh, that's right. You and I were talking right before we began the broadcast about appearing on stage at Ford's Theater here in Washington, D.C., and the president being there. So as they say back in West Virginia, where we're from, David, you have walked in some pretty high cotton. <laughs> David Selby, our guest today on this joint broadcast of Zoom Into Books and uh, the Big Time Talker podcast. He's a award-winning author and an actor in many, many shows, and we're getting great questions. So I want to throw some of these out to you. Were the Quentin sideburns from your character on Dark Shadows real or glued on? No, they were glued on, but then I tried to grow them. Yeah, and how'd that work out? To, they would have to glue on, and then for a while I did wear, but they weren't near as good as the glued on ones because they had that kind of, I don't know. Um, and if you look at a couple of guys in the mid-60s, um, I was looking at him last night and I said, oh my God, he's got Quentin sideburns. And uh, was it Neil Young or I can't yes, remember. in the documentary had Quentin Collins sideburns for sure. Yeah. Um, anyway, they, uh, they were fake. Vinny, the makeup person, Vinny, what's Vinny's name? Vinny Lascazo. Vinny came up with the sideburns and made them and every day would glue them on me. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you're, you're watching live and you'd like to send a question in, be sure to tell us where you're from. We have folks checking in from all over the country. Here's somebody from, from Long Island. Uh, here's a, a lady who's been a volunteer at the Dark Shadows Fests. So you have uh, these, these Dark Shadows appearances that still continue today. That show, 50 years later, still has a fan base. And, and you participate in some of these festivals to go out and, and meet the fans. Yes, I do. I, because... Uh... It's just a, a way of touching base, you know, and saying thank you for uh, thank you for your support through the years. We're we're seeing lots of uh, pictures if you look online of you with all these beautiful and famous leading ladies. You talked about uh, Barbara Streisand. Yeah. You co-starred in a movie of Barbara Streisand. I see a, Morgan Fairchild up there. Yeah, Morgan Fairchild. I wonder if at any point. Uh, the wife, Mrs. Selby, gets a little jealous with you having, you know, these, these kissing scenes and love scenes with the most beautiful women in Hollywood. So uh, give us that. How do you navigate that, River? <laughs> she cashes all the checks. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, if you've got a question for David, we would love for you to send it in. Here's someone from Germany who's checking in to say hello and uh, – He's a, a reader of your books. Oh, there you are, hugging up on Susan Sullivan. Uh, yes. um, and you've done some reunions with the Falcon Crest cast as well. Uh, yes. Have, have you... I, we've seen, I talked with uh, Susan, I trade emails, but we saw her not too long ago at lunch, you know. Um, so, yes, we uh, keep in touch, uh, especially... And even some of the uh, the Dark Shadows people, uh, you wouldn't know them, but uh, um, Jim Storm, uh, Chris Pennick, um, Catherine Scott, um, Laura Parker, so many uh, that we all are still dear friends. As an actor, do you have a sense, and this is a question from one of our folks that, that is watching uh, from Al, uh, do you have a sense whenever one of these projects uh, happens that it's going to be huge or conversely that it's not going to do well? Because anyone who's had a career as long as yours, you've had some uh, things that really connected with the public like Dark Shadows and Falcon Crest. And then there have been some other projects that, that didn't. So do you have any kind of sense as you begin these things, what's going to hit and what's not? No, I... Uh... Early on, I can remember they were doing a show that uh, uh, actually they'd sent me the book on. It was based on an old book, old novel called Flamingo Road. And uh, when we when I went out, it had already been shooting a year. And the best thing out of Flamingo Road was I made you know some good friends. But um, it led to that's what led to Falcon Crest. Uh, so I was there, and uh, we knew uh, Flamingo Road wasn't going to make it. Uh, so um, I met uh, um, the uh, man at, uh, oh, a couple of people, but the man who 
uh, was responsible for the Waltons, Earl Hamner. And I met Earl and we became very good friends. And um, it was through Earl that we also did <coughs> Falcon Crest. But um, the people at Lormar Productions, uh, they're the ones that uh, helped me out uh, at that particular time. Merv Adelson, who ran Lormar, uh, was a, uh, you know, a big, was a friend and a supporter. And he's the one that insisted that I do Falcon Cross. And David Selby is our guest today, and uh, he's got a long story career in Hollywood, as well as an author and a poet. You can pick up his books, including his latest Promises of Love at davidselby.com. Um, David, you also have the distinction of winning the first ever Golden Raspberry Award in the history of cinema for your film, Raise the Titanic. So let's, <laughs> let's go back and talk about that one for Raise a minute. Raise the Titanic. <laughs> I'll bet it got a few. Um, actually, you know, there were good stories behind Raise the Titanic. I'd already been friends with a lovely actor. We did a, a mini series together. It was the first mini series after uh, the Alex Haley mini series Roots. Right. And this was called Washington Behind Closed Doors. And it was with a wonderful actor named Jason Robarts, who was just a magnificent actor and a lovely man. So, I got a call one day and said, uh, I was in this producer's office in Los Angeles. I'd been working there on another project. I got a call and they wanted to talk to me. So I went over and then Jason, during that meeting, Jason happened to call in. And so they said, Jason wants to talk to you. So I got on, they said, he said, David, we got to do this. They're going to take us all over the world. And they're going to take our families and everybody. Uh, and so it was called Raise the Titanic. And we thought, oh, this sounds like a wonderful adventure. And it was. It was, a, I can't tell you how big of an adventure it was. It was terrific. In fact, there's a, there's a man in England uh, still writing a book on the making of that film. Now, we went over. We traveled the world. A lovely producer, I mean, who, who kept his word, Lou Grade, uh, he brought our families with us. Uh, we traveled around uh, and made this film. And of course, when you make something, you don't, you know, everything is positive. You, you want everything to be, you know, whatever, good. But the best thing that came out of that for, for me was, was cementing a relationship with Jason and uh, reacquainting uh, with Richard Jordan, and then another actress, Ann Archer, uh, meeting Ann, and so much that Ann agreed later to come on to Falcon Crest. But it was meeting those people, Alec Guinness, Alec, Sir Alec Guinness. Sure. I, I, it was meant so much, so that the film, <clears throat> I, you know, I guess in the end didn't tie together. Uh, so I could understand, I guess, the Raspberry Award. But it did not detract from the experience of making the film. A director came in and replaced the original director. And that director uh, who re came in and uh, was Jerry Jameson. And Jerry is... Still, he is a wonderful man, <coughs> and uh, his son, and uh, so we made that film, and I have nothing but great, ex great memories from it. Yeah. David Selby, our guest today, and uh, we're talking Hollywood, we're talking books, and you know, Raise the Titanic, David, was based on a book by Clive Cussler, who's a fantastic writer. And, Dear uh, Clive. 
Yeah, and, and I should have gone under. He wanted me to go uh, 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 treasury hunting with him for sunken treasures. <laughs> wow, I, I believe you should have taken him up on that. Yeah. Anyway, so as a guy like Clive Kessler, I mean, you're a writer. You've written a lot of books. Um, talk to me about the difference in that creative process as a writer as opposed to being an actor. And is there one or the other that you enjoy more? No, um, not really. I think it was acting that allowed me to write uh, the books. I, I started writing early on. Uh, I would write poetry. And then just to, you know, pass the day or to get through when I was on location. And then my mother passed away. And the only way I could deal with it, she was the hardest worker I ever really knew, is that I wrote about her life in a series of poems called My Mother's Autumn. And so I, I, I wrote that and I started thinking about how important West Virginia had been to me. Uh, and that's where I came up with Promises of Love, because Promises of Love was, and if I had, you know, we all had time, I would read some, but was a man's story of, of what he wanted to do with his life. And it's like all of my things, they're based on people here and there. I take great license license with such things. But in the promises of love, it's what love meant and the promise of love, what it can give us. And so his, his ambition when he was a kid was to go to Harvard University. And it didn't work out. But he ended up going to University of Alabama. And then he went from there to medical school and then became a great doctor who opened his own hospital in Appalachia, Southern Appalachia. Uh, so I wrote about that and then his hopes for his children. Of course, he wanted his daughter to go to Harvard, which in the book she does. And his son almost made it. And then the casualty of a difference, I wrote about, oh, West Virginia and the, the hard times in parts of West Virginia that people have had to deal with over the years. And of course it goes back to to the early days of coal mining, my grandfather, Grandpa McIntyre, was a coal miner and worked all his days. The coal company lived in a coal camp, and the coal camp moved him up into a place called, well, it was Evertsville, uh, up from Edna, West Virginia, up in the northern part. But then I became and he was a longtime coal miner, along with uh, a couple of my uncles. And one of my uncles, they passed from black lung. And so many memories I had of that time that when I spent a good bit of time in Southern West Virginia, I thought about the title. Uh, and my wife came up with it. And it's called A Casualty of Indifference. And it's what happens. I don't know, I get uh, a little upset, to tell you the truth. I don't know whether I can continue. But it, it's what happens when we become too casual about what's going on. And it's, an, it's a casualty of indifference where we just are indifferent to whatever it is that's going on in our country. And in West Virginia's sake at that time, it was uh, the drugs. Uh, it was coal was, you know, going away. There were so many things. 
that were happening that I just felt I wanted to write about the book and write about it in the book. But the one gal, her dream in Southern West Virginia and her daddy, <laughs> her sister had been killed. But her daddy, he always, they always supported me. And like a couple that I know, she went on to sing at the county fair, <laughs> at county fairs. And then she, uh, she wrote a song that did well. And then I said, oh, now that I've got her singing, I've got to write a song. <laughs> so I started writing songs. I got a whole book of them, but I, I won't read this the whole thing to you, but this is my home where I belong. And it's partly me, but it's this young gal. Her name is Mary Ellen. Just to be is my dream. Ride a cloud to the sea, swing high on beauty's vine, sweetly free and oh so fine. The places I could be, but Hollywood and Vine is not where I want to be. <clears throat> this is my home where I belong. No need to swirl and twirl, I'm just a hillbilly girl, feeling the cool breeze of autumn's eve, waiting for time to bring me home again to you. And I, it goes on, the song goes on, but I won't. <laughs> That's beautiful. Torture, the song goes on. <clears throat> but it's how I always felt about West Virginia. And I was always waiting for time to bring me home to West Virginia. And I've been that way my whole life. From the moment we left Morgantown, just the two of us, we left Beckley, and we didn't know where we were, what was going to happen. But all the time, <clears throat> I would make it back. And I still have the image of my mother standing at the screen door every time I would leave and she would wait and I could not even look back because she stood at the screen door until I got to the end of the block, the street there and made a turn. So she would watch me all the way. <laughs> yeah. So I've always had that feeling about uh, West Virginia and the, the place that meant so much to both of us. David right. Silby, our guest today, is uh, a proud West Virginian, and his uh, last couple of books have been published by Independent Publisher of the Year, headline books based in West Virginia as well. It's, uh, it's that West Virginia mafia. We're out there all over the country, all over the world. David, so many questions are coming in from uh, our viewers and our listeners today to Zoom into Books and the Big Time Talker podcast. Um, let's see if we can grab a couple of these. Here's an interesting comment that I've gotten from a couple of different young ladies who have said that they have actually named their kids uh, after your character, after Quentin on Dark Shadows. Uh, so I, I find that pretty interesting and fascinating. Um, I'm oh, quite honored. Quentin <laughs> would be honored. Quentin is honored. <laughs> That's uh, fantastic. Yeah. In fact, yeah. I met, there was a director. His name is Quentin. Is He is a director, famous. Quentin Tarantino. And uh, we were watching a film together that I had done many, many years ago, a yeah, film yeah. that he liked. So after it was all over, I mean, we're sitting there talking. We sat beside each other. And he said, David, you know, I never really was crazy about my name. And I was young and whatever, whatever. And then your character came along. And suddenly, Quentin was a good Quentin name. is cool. Quentin was cool. Yeah, that Quentin Tarantino, he's done pretty good for himself, David. I'm not sure if you're aware, but he's done okay. He certainly has. <laughs> uh, there's a great photo of you on, on the Mighty Ducks uh, set. And uh, here's a great question. Favorite co-stars that you've worked with? Oh, favorite co-stars. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you had a long list. I mean, you work with some pretty big names. I mean, you co-starred in a movie with Barbara Streisand. I mean, the yeah, list goes Barbara on and on. Was, uh, is, was, is a sweetheart. 
Um, uh, she really was, but I, you know, who? I mean, there were so many. I mean, uh, I was, uh, you know, I have to mention, uh, you know, was, go back and you can talk about Susan Sullivan. You can talk about Jane Wyman, Joan Bennett, Laura Parker, and going back to those old shows, Kathy Scott, uh, just so many. Um, well, let me ask you this way then, who would you like to work with or would have liked to work with that you haven't had the opportunity yet? Oh, goodness, Burke, I, I don't know. There, uh, yeah, I was a big fan still of English, uh, you know, would have been nice to work with. I watched Albert Finney the other, last week, and he did a, uh, a film about Churchill, Winston Churchill, right before World War II started. And my dad had been in World War II, and I was just curious about that. And in fact, I was shooting a movie in Paris, uh, in France, all over France one time. And I asked, I wanted mom and my mother and father to come. And I, I told him, I kept saying, dad, I'll pay for everything. He said, son, I've been there. I have no desire to go back. So he was when, uh, was it Normandy, the invasion of, and when they went to France, uh, he was on a supply ship. Wow. Anyway, uh, there was so many that uh, I worked with that I, Albert Finney would have been great uh, to work with. Um, you know, all of those people. I never got to work on stage with Jason Robarts. Um, so I would, uh, you know, would have loved that. But there, you know, every actor, most actors, every actor has a story. Every actor has a, you know, a desire, a wish. And everybody comes to it with, a lot of times they come to it with their heart on their sleeve. Here's another great question that's come in, and this is on, on David Selby, the author. Who, and this is from Joan, who's watching and listening today, who is your favorite author and what is your favorite book? you got to nail them down to one. Favorite oh. author and favorite book. <laughs> uh, well, he wrote songs, too. Leonard Cohen. Yeah. Do you know who Leonard Cohen is? Absolutely. Leonard Cohen was, you know, Hallelujah. special. Um, books. Um, my wife just finished one about World War II. Uh, I've got one on my bedside now about, uh, well, I'd have to get up and go get it. <laughs> um, anyway, just so many. I turn around and see, see that bookshelf. Yeah, you're a reader. That's just, these are, uh, yeah, right here. It's called Lincoln and Churchill. <laughs> I haven't finished it yet. <laughs> but uh, it's called Statesman at War. And so I, I like things, you know, I, tend to, to certain books like that. Um, Here's another have, interesting question for you, David, and this has to do with, uh, with your continuing to work. You, uh, there's a, a fan who, who saw a recent movie you did. Uh, you said, he said he, you played a pastor in the movie Loon Lake, and that was creepier than Quentin could ever be. Uh, we know you just did Chicago Fire. Somebody asked about uh, NCIS New Orleans. Yes, you, you've been at this a long time, and you have those two big, you know, iconic TV shows. So if you never worked again, uh, your legacy is secure. Why are you still at it? Why do you still do it? <laughs> you know, why? Why not just sit back and rest on your laurels at this point? I, uh, there's no way. You come from West Virginia. You're a worker. <laughs> what do you do? You get up in the morning. You go to work. Or what? You're a workhorse, not a show horse. Is that a what you're telling me? Horse. Um. But Back Fork was, again, a moving story. Uh, Josh did, Josh Stewart. And Bob Tenno, Bob was a producer on that. Um, direct. 
But anyway, a lovely film that we shot in West Virginia. Um, so you still enjoy it? You still enjoy I the still process? Enjoy it. I still get a big kick out of it, yes. And I, I uh, there, were, there were projects that I'm, you know, I've got a couple of plays that I'm s scheduled to do uh, if and when. Uh, if and if the money is raised for them, but two, they've been written uh, for me, so that's wonderful. Um, I just read a new film script, so yes, I, I get ex excited about all of that, you know. Still working, still, yes, going out there. A couple of Falcon Quest uh, Crest questions that have come in. Uh, two of them, does David still know the second name of Richard Channing? And does he really like glasses of milk as much as Richard did on the show? <laughs> you know, they asked me to do a milk commercial uh, well, did they? <laughs> <laughs> when I was on that show. Got milk? I didn't. I couldn't. Um, and I don't drink milk any. I know. I When I was a kid, God, I drank milk by the court, you know. Um, they go, I'd go out to the farm and watch my uh, uncle milk the cows. <laughs> Um, there used to be a great dairy down in Morgantown called Chico's Dairy. I don't know if you ever heard of it, but it was, sure. it was a great dairy. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, now here's a question that, that I, I think is interesting. Um, it has to do with one of your movie titles in the mid 1990s, you did a movie, and this, this actually, David, might be my favorite movie title in your entire repertoire. You did a movie called Headless Body and a Topless Bar. <laughs> you knew where I was going with that. Tell me about that movie. That movie was based on a true story. It was a headline, as I remember, as I recollect, uh, in the, in New, the York New York Post. Post. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And uh, a couple of guys got together. Um, young man, uh, a guy named James Bruce directed it. Um, and Ross, oh, what are their names? A lovely uh, man that uh, I've got the poster out there. Um, anyway, they put the film together. And again, it was a low budget film. And we shot it down in. Uh, I think we were at a studio down in Southern California, yeah. Um, and yeah. Ready? I love it. That and, that is the movie title. And to just end body on the and a topless bar, and that was the headline. Yes. That's perfect. Uh, if you happen to be watching on Facebook Live, and of course we're simulcasting this in the Big Time Talker podcast and zoom into books, there's a great photo right there of you with, with President Lincoln and and you've had a tie to Lincoln throughout much of your career. Tell me about your interest in Abraham Lincoln. Well, there was a, uh, when I ended up at school, uh, we ended up at school for a little while. It's a place called Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, Illinois. And there was a, a lovely man there that I'm still in touch with. He and his wife, uh, Christian Moe, M-O-E. His father, as I recall, had been head of the Guggenheim Foundation. And Chris was a professor, director, writer. And um, he's the first one I went to work with doing it while I was in school. Doing, I mean, I guess I was tall enough that I could play, <laughs> I could play Lincoln. And that time I had dark hair. Um, so I started in school out there. And we actually took readings around the state of Illinois at that time. Uh, and then when I went to New York, I met a composer, musician, wonderful pianist, Earl Wilde. And Earl Wilde uh, was down at ABC one day and he, this is before I started Dark Shadows. And he said, David, I've, uh, I've got a play, uh, a little film I want to do on, uh, Lincoln, I can't even remember the title right now. Oh, Flatboat Man, Flatboat Man it was called uh, because Lincoln made a little trip on the flatboat I think, down the Mississippi. But anyway, 
so he wrote that and we did it. Uh, it was an ABC show called Directions at that time. And we, again, no money, but we did it live before the cameras uh, at ABC Studios on 67th Street in Columbus in New York City. And then um, it was later on, I was doing um, uh, a show. Um, I went back to Illinois and did a show called Mr. High Pockets about Lincoln. And then I got an invite uh, from uh, a television show uh, to portray Lincoln in it. And then eventually um, I got a call about Ford's Theater. Um, and so I flew to New York to meet the producer, director. And uh, they said, will you come and do this play? So it was a play where they were reopening Ford's Theater and they had never done a play about Lincoln at Ford's Theater. And they were having to retrofit the theater, it had been remodeled and retrofitted, I guess for earthquakes or whatever. So I thought, oh, how wonderful, I'm gonna get to do. So um, <clears throat> we did this play uh, in New York, I mean, in, in D.C., at Ford's Theater, the heavens are black. I think that was it. It was after a line in Shakespeare's Macbeth. And a, a lovely writer, James Sill, wrote it. And anyway, we did it at, at Ford's Theater, and it did quite well. Uh, I think the play was nominated for a Pulitzer or whatever later. But anyway, and then, so I did that for a while, and then I started going back to Ford's. I went back and did another play um, for them. And uh, then I started going back just doing special programs. So Ford's Theater over my life has become um, a very important, it, means a great deal to me. David, when I was doing broadcasting in Utah, in Salt Lake City, several years ago, uh, they were filming Touched by an Angel there, and you actually portrayed oh, President that's Lincoln where. on Touched by an Angel. Yeah, where, where, when you were in Utah? I, I was. I was in Salt Lake City in the 90s when they were doing Touched by an Angel with Roman. That's where I did. I did Touched by an Angel, and I did Lincoln that's on right. that show. In fact, a lovely story. My mother passed away right during, before I would, so I had to fly to Morgantown. And so I notified Touch by an Angel people that I wouldn't be able to do the show because of what happened. They sent me back a quick wire and said, David, we will wait for you. We want you. So when I got off, you know, they delayed shooting for a few days. When I got there, there was a lovely note that said, we hope that this will be a healing time for you. And uh, it w w what a gift. And that was touched by an angel. Wow. Wow. Oh, that's fantastic. David Selby, our guest today on this special co-broadcast of Zoom Into Books and the Big Time Talker podcast. We're talking to David about movies, television, books, and we have just a couple of minutes. If you have a question you'd like to get in, we'll try to pose as many of them as we can. Uh, to David Selby, and if you'd like to pick up a copy of any of his books, including A Casualty of Indifference that he spoke about or Promises of Love, all the books available at davidselby.com. And David, since you're home for right now, will you be able to, to sign those books as folks order them? Oh, yes. Yeah, I mean, if they're ordered, that's the, only, <laughs> that's the reason we do that for those uh, people who want them signed. Um, I would do better, or I what I if I could go out on tour and you know to go to places and and take care of that. Then that's one of the reasons why I still did the, the conventions or whatever. It's a way for you to say hello and to be able to sign some things or you know whatever. Oh, that's um, great. 
you mentioned, David, that, that you worked with. And I don't Bell. charge for photos or anything like that. I'm not in that game. Oh, that's great. Uh, that's that West Virginia upbringing that's, that's coming <laughs> through. You mentioned that you, you knew and worked with Earl Hamner, uh, yeah. who very well known, of course, is the, the, the guy behind the Waltons as well as, as your uh, primetime soaps. Um, is it true that you were the only other man besides her husband that ever kissed Olivia Walton? Olivia Walton. Is that right? The only, uh, only other uh, husband besides her husband portrayed by Ralph Waite. Yes. <laughs> And uh, Michael Leonard and I are still friends. We did a play together a few years ago out here, uh, about three years ago, I guess. But Michael is uh, wonderful, terrific, a lovely lady. And uh, we like to work together. In fact, we'd like to work together again, so. You have, and you talk about your work, you have done something pretty amazing as, as an actor. You have worked steadily now for many decades. And I'm sure there are, there are other young people who are watching or listening who are amazed by that. And I wonder if, if you could tell us if you have any tips or techniques to, to get steady work, because that's a, a real up and down business. How have you been able to hang in there and work steadily over Gosh, is, could this be right over 50 years? <laughs> um, I think a good, you know, for me, and it was strictly for me, theater was a good training ground, uh, good discipline. And I, I thought that, you know, maybe, maybe that's part and parcel. But Knowing your craft, you know, and it always begins with the script. If you don't have good words to say, so all of the writers, that's where, you know, it, it begins with the story, with the script, with the words on the page. And if you've got that, you've got a head start. So, uh, and, and the... I, I guess the other thing is don't give up. Don't give up. Persistence, if you want. And you got to want it, but persistence. And, you know, they, they say there is no such thing as a small role. <laughs> there are no small roles, uh, no small actors. Um, so, and then learn, you know, you can, that's why working with Jason uh, was taught me so much. Joan Bennett, Jane Wyman, Cesar Romero. Um, there was so many, uh, so many of those actors to learn from. Um, and the joy. And you know, you respect the joy you have for the work itself and for the people you're working with. And that is, uh, that is so important, you know. Is there a part that you were close to or that you were up for that you turned down that you now have a regret that you didn't take? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is a good question. I want to hear. No, the we won't get into that. But <laughs> that's a good question. But there were there were a couple where I, uh, you know, but other things were in the way, and you can't do everything, right? Because you're working, and I can't do I can't do that. I remember once I made a mistake, and I I went in to meet a director, and I he asked me if I was a fan of the book and I, I and I, I I said well the band the book just bothered me I didn't dare uh, but and I won't get into all of that but later my the wonderful supporter that I had in my corner was a lovely lady named her name was Marion Doherty and Mary was one of the first casting people in New York she was she liked to put theater people into films and stuff so I was in California when I had that meeting and that she had set up. 
<laughs> I was working with another project that she put me in. And I, Marion called me and said, David, whatever you do, you don't say you don't, you don't like the book. <laughs> I said, well, I didn't like the book. It scared me. Anyway, but <laughs> there, there are always moments where it's simply, it's usually out of frustration. You can't do everything. And you just be glad to be able to do the things that you have done. And knock on wood, may there be a couple more to come. You did Dark Shadows in, in such a rapid clip. You talked about shooting that thing five days a week. You, you yeah. have that, that theater discipline as well. Uh, is there something, and this is a great question from Michelle, who's watching and listening in Los Angeles. Is there a preference for you, whether it's doing a, a theater piece performing on stage, uh, doing TV or, or film work, or even the, the voiceover work you, you did, uh, Commissioner Gordon in the, the Batman animated shows. Do you, do you like one more than another? And has that changed down through the years? No, no. It's what you get to say. It's what you get. Again, it's the words on the page. And uh, those are the kinds of things that, you know, I still get a kick out of it. I still enjoy. And I'm always touched or when someone wants you to do something, you know, so anyway. When this is all over, do you want to get back out there? Are you going to maybe get back down to New Orleans and do uh, your character on NCIS again? <laughs> you, have, you have things lined up and ready to go well, whenever it all happens? There were, there were some talks of d different things, you know, but right now, I definitely have the plays. Uh, I'm just looking up at a picture up there with my dear friend, Jane Alexander. And uh, was just talking to Jane the other day. She lives up in Nova Scotia right now. But she just did a lovely character on a show called Modern Love. And uh, so, you know, you... you comes down to people I would you know love to work with Jane again we've done a few things together a few plays and a few television things um, do you find that TV and, and movies today do they speak to you as much as they did uh, when you first got in back in the 60s like everybody you... else you're looking for something and there are so many things on the stream right. <laughs> since we're all uh, uh, homebound or whatever uh, that you you can't imagine and you don't know how to choose and I'll start I'll watch this and I want but um, that's how I came upon I wanted to watch Jacob Dylan because he's what a lovely young man he is oh my god what a and, talent uh, anyway that's how I started watching the what's it called echo in the canyon yep echoes in the canyon that's echoes right. in the canyon because I you know it's a throwback to Laurel Canyon days but um I, yeah, I mean, today I just, uh, you know, I'm like everybody else. You, how many things can they put on? I mean, uh, with all these different networks, you know, Netflix and et cetera. <laughs> well, and, and hopefully that means lots more opportunities for folks in, in your line of work, especially That's when exactly right. That's when how you, things things up. you look at it and you say, well, knock on wood, one, one of these will come your way. <laughs> We're almost out of time. Uh, David Selby has been our guest. It's been a wonderful conversation. And, and truly, David, I have to tell you, you can't see them on your screen. I do. We have people checking in from all over the world. I, I see a message from a gentleman watching right now in the UK, the Isle of Man. Uh, and so from uh, five, five different continents, folks are, are checking you out, watching and listening today. That's got to uh, make you feel good. It uh, makes me feel good. And uh, if you were close and could see... You know, I uh, is that what happens? You get a little older and you get so doggone sentimental. But I've always been that way. Um, you know, my grandson sent my wife a, a letter the other day telling her how much she meant to him in his young life and what he did for her. Well, by the end of the time, the end of the little letter, I'm crying. So is she. So when I read about or hear about what you just said, Burke, about some people watching 
or uh, I'm so touched. I'm so bloody thankful to, uh, to be able to say hello. I love you and please in this day and age, in this time that we are living in, take care of yourselves, please take care of yourselves and those you are with you. Um, that's all. And my love, I wish I could almost go and, you know, <laughs> hug everybody. Well, we'll uh, send some virtual hugs your way. David Selby, not only a fantastic actor, uh, of stage and screen. Also fantastic author. He's written many books, including poetry and, and uh, fiction novels, A Casualty of Indifference, Promises of Love from our friends at Headline Books. They're all available now at davidselby.com. And there's a whole uh, treasure trove of information about David's long and storied career, including, David, including your appearance in Headless Body in a <laughs> Topless Bar. You're not going to let that go, are you? No, sir. Uh, Russell, Russell, uh, Taylor Nichols, I'm just, all the names that are coming back. There was a lovely, what was his name? Was it Paul Williams? He was a singer and he was also. Yeah, Paul Williams, sure. Was that, uh, I think, wasn't it Paul who was in it? Yes, sir. That's right. <laughs> Some, Little I'm, guy. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Thank I, you for spending time with us today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you all. Love to everybody. Please take care. The incredible David Selby, author, actor, and most of all, a proud native West Virginian. Thank you so much for watching and listening today for Zoom into Books and the Big Time Talker podcast powered by Speaker Match. I'm Burke Allen in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. Bye, everybody.